Cool Voices evolved as a result of my own experiences of sexual abuse and sexual violence, like through childhood, but even in my adult years as well. I, I never actually reflected or had the opportunity to heal through my childhood trauma because who gives us that support in South Asian spaces? No one does. My name is Nick Nagarko and you are locked into Culture TV. For the culture, by the culture. Let's go. How did Core Voices come yeah. about? Um, a little bit about my background is yeah. that I have worked in the um, in the academic field. So I've been yeah. a lecturer at one of the universities in London. Yeah. And my area of study has been um, kind of twofold. I've been stu I studied criminology mm -hmm. and I also studied Sikh music as okay. a form of therapy. Okay, wow. So um, what we were talking about, how growing up around racism, yeah. what it helped me to evolve into was this, yeah. that I became fascinated about my culture, yeah. about my heritage and about yeah. my roots. So yes, there's a silver lining in it for me, but for most people there isn't. Mm -hmm. So my, my professional background is in academia yeah. as a researcher, lecturer and um, an educator. Mental health is real. Yeah. And I wanted to understand it. And for me, um, my roots helped me to connect with that, to know that the faith that I follow and the values that I practice are aligned with helping humanity to connect with wellness. Yeah. That was the most empowering thing that I've experienced on my journey. Yeah. And um, it so makes me the feel- passion behind it Yeah, all. and it makes me feel very proud to know that, you know, my, my ancestors, the, the, the my forefathers essentially had that same vision of human wellness, mm -hmm. not just for one community, but for all humanity. And the idea was to recognize the human race as one. Yeah. And that is what my faith teaches. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to <laughs> share with people. So the opportunity to study academically was just, it was a blessing. Yeah. So, so rare and I'm very, very lucky to have had that chance. Um, working in that space of therapy helped me to understand a lot of these topics that we've talked about from a more compassionate lens. Before I'd look at it one dimensional and I'd be very angry about stuff, just like most of us are as yeah. teenagers. Um, but the angle of therapy encourages you to listen and wonder, to question that, hang on, what else is there behind this? What else is there behind somebody's anger or their behavior? There's a story behind it. And when we try to understand that narrative that's led them up to that point, we get to problem solving, we get to finding solutions, we get to helping each other. And yeah. that's what I'm interested in. So that's been my professional background. I'm, I'm a musician and a performer as well in that same field. Um, core Voices evolved as a result of my own experiences of sexual abuse and sexual violence, like mm -hmm. through childhood, but even in my adult years as mm -hmm. well, I, I never actually reflected or had the opportunity to heal through my childhood trauma because who gives us that support in mm -hmm. South Asian spaces? No one does. Exactly, yeah. They tell you to shut up or you, I never actually told anybody. So nobody knew, mm -hmm. um, nobody could have helped me. And, um, when I did start to think about it, it was too painful. That was like in my teen years when mm. it was like PTSD, it was coming back. Right. And I didn't understand what was happening. And then, you know, you suppress it again. But it was, um, there was a trigger point in 2017, just shortly after the Me Too movement had begun, begun in the world. Yeah. Um, I saw people like tweeting, hashtag Me Too. Yeah. And it, it did something inside because I was like, I want to, but if I do, then people are going to know. Mm. And in our community, if as a woman, you come forward with something like that, all of a sudden you're tainted, you are, you know, you, you're faulty goods. No one's going to want to touch you or marry you or speak mm. to you. And you, 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 not just you are ostracized, but the whole of your family is. It's almost like you become untouchable. Yeah. That's the, the mindset that we have towards victims of abuse. Yeah. Which so, is a very old fashioned mindset isn't it it is but i think we're still stuck there culturally yeah. we haven't evolved much from it and i saw that all the people who were tweeting in 2017 i think it was in october when it started were people of white or black heritage yeah. 
there weren't no South Asian women coming forward. And I was like, hell no, I'm not about to do that because <laughs> Be people, are, exactly, people are going to know. And I was like, I, I can't deal with that yeah. um, because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm known in my community for the work that I do. And I was like, I, I no, not ready. Can't do it. Right. Literally a month and a half after that movement kicked off, I'm in a situation where I was assaulted. Wow. So I was a victim of sexual assault while I was away on a tour in the US. And um, it messed with me. It went, messed with me so hard because I have I had a great passion for martial arts. And like I told you, my, my younger years, it was, I was trained to fight back. Mm. I grew up around three brothers and you have to be able to hold your own because they, you either get the shit kicked out of you yeah. or you learn how to fight back. Yeah. And it was, it was normal or it was, um, it didn't frighten me to fight mm -hmm. people, basically. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's how I had to survive my high school and my primary school as well, was to fight back. Um, but in this particular incident, what messed with me is that I froze. And we don't think about the responses in a moment of trauma or shock or surprise. When somebody yeah. catches you off guard, there's different responses that you'll have, yeah, you know, the fight, flight. Uh, freeze or fawn these yeah. are like the the four responses that you have i thought i would have fought back i would have kicked the shit out of this guy <laughs> that's what i thought yeah and that was my that was maybe my ego i don't know what it was but in that moment or your previous experience of how you've dealt with situations yeah i guess I guess, but in my previous experiences of any situation of assault, I was too young to have fought back. Okay. So it kind of became more of the fawn right. response. And um, like people throwing like words and stuff at you, catcalling, all of that stuff. There I would, you know, throw a few words back, but now I'm physically being assaulted and I froze. And that was the most difficult part of processing that incident for me why did i freeze mm. and um it was it was actually my younger brother who helped me to understand like why i reacted that way and i shouldn't be beating myself up i shouldn't be angry with me um it then helped me to contemplate further and deeper and my whole journey for myself is if we can share our experiences together, we can help other people as well. Yeah. Whatever happens to us individually never happens individually. There's always somebody else out there who's been through it. Yeah. Um, but not everybody has the strength to share their experiences because yeah. it's re-traumatizing yourself when you're trying to go back there yeah. or help another person while you're struggling or drowning. It, it doesn't work for everybody. And um, I've always tried to be able to create spaces where I can help other people yeah. and it comes quite naturally to me now because I've literally done that all of my life and through this I was almost this close to just letting it slide and it wasn't until I was asked the question that what are you going to do about it how are you going to deal with this? Are you going to report this guy or what are you going to do? And yes, that's the ideal. You want to report the person, you want to see them go to prison <laughs> and then justice has been served but I know from other experiences that I've had, um, different experiences, um, I lost one of my brothers many years ago and the person who took his life, he was sent to prison for life, which means 15 years in England. And when this person was sentenced, it didn't provide me with any relief yeah. or any solace and nothing magically went away. So in my head, I knew that if in that incident, which is so horrific and so severe and life changing, if I was, if I didn't feel that sense of relief that yes, justice has been served, this person's been sent to prison and now everything in the world will be great again. It didn't happen. Mm. How is it going to happen now? So what do I want from this? And if I'm talking about me individually, I'd have wished it never happened, right? I'd have wished that I could just forget about it and carry on. But um, I realized that by doing that, I become complacent by doing nothing. I allow people like him to exist in this world without being held accountable, yeah. allowing them to harm other people. Do I agree with that? No, I don't agree with that. So what am I gonna do about it? Mm. 
And it's not about making an example of one person, but it's it's trying to find the right course of justice. Because one by one, yes, we can correct or help individuals to find justice or get better or whatever we want to say. And then maybe that can have a domino effect in society and we live in an ideal world, maybe one day. That's, yeah. you know, we all have that vision of wanting to live in a better world. So it was wanting to do right for the next generation because the generation before us, like if I look at my mom, she suffered domestic abuse for the entirety of her marriage. We're talking like more than 30 years of really violent abuse. Um, my dad was a chronic alcoholic and my mom was his punch bag, as were we as his kids. And she, her strength was in enduring that. I thought it was a weakness, but I realized that if she was weak, she would have got out of there. Yeah. She stayed through it because she didn't want to inconvenience her parents who were in India and she wanted to keep her family together and protect her kids. And there's also this stigma as well within South Asian families of, it's not like in, <clears throat> British families can divorce quite easily and, yeah. it, and it's it seemed as, as no thing. But in Indian families, Pakistani families, it's it's pretty rare. And in that generation, like you talk in the 80s and 90s, it was, it was definitely a heavy stigma. Like yeah. it, it, and for my mom, it didn't sit, it didn't align with her value system. So divorcing wasn't even an option. Mm. Um, so she, she went through all of that. And if I'd have, I, I idealized as a kid that if I was in her situation, what would I have done? I thought I would have gotten myself out of there, took my kids away and problem solved. She's, she didn't speak English. She, my dad had all, he held all of the financial strings. She didn't know how to do things here in the, um, in this country, in this mm -hmm. foreign land. Mm -hmm. um, she would have been worse off. Yeah. It would have completely messed us up. So her not doing that for me, because she didn't have the resources to, I only understood much later in my life. And for me, I was like, okay, now I, I live in a generation of privilege where mm. we can talk, we're having this <clears throat> conversation now, that's pretty, you know, we've come a long way to yeah. be able to go from there to here. Um, it was that accountability, that what seeds of goodness can I plant for the next generation or what layers of safety can I help to create yeah. for that next generation? I'm not saying I'm the only one, but if, if one of us stands up, it might give courage and strength to others to stand up and try to do the same thing. And that was the reason that Core Voices was created is to have those conversations that are labeled as taboo or um, seen as not being respectful in our community, breaking yeah. those stigmas normalizing that these things happen. Mental health is a thing, domestic abuse is a mm -hmm. thing, alcohol abuse is a thing. These are things that all go in our community, but one of the most, um, I, I have to say it is life-threatening, is sexual abuse, because there are so many victims of it in the South Asian community that have never had the opportunity to come forward because of these barriers of shame yeah. and the, the fear of ostracize, ostracization, I can't yeah. even say the word right now, um, and not ever being seen as dignified or the fear of never being married because someone knows that you've been harmed. Yeah. Um, all of those things are still real in this world that we live in now, in this 21st century. And the hope is that through this small project that we started through this movement is to be able to provide a safe space to have those conversations and for those that want resources to direct them to resources and on, on a wider level to be able to support organizations, especially faith spaces yeah. um, in, in our various different <clears throat> South Asian communities to bring in adequate levels of safeguarding and safety. So doing trainings for safeguarding yeah. from the Charities Commission is not enough. That's, that's, not, that's not sufficient. That is the base standard to say, okay, we've got this, we did that two hour training on Zoom, here's the certificate. Okay, how are you actually going to implement that into the community? How are you going to protect your young people? Mm -hmm. Where is the action? And that's the part that we want to hold those institutions accountable to. I see the flaws in the Punjabi and the Sikh community, and I know that it 
in in our faith spaces they matter a lot to us yeah. uh, whether you're a hindu or a muslim or you're a sikh our faith spaces are the centers of our community yeah. so i understand those sensitivities mm. and i respect them as well yeah i'm not trying to come in with a hammer and say take them down and yeah. let's rebuild them there's lots of work that we need to do but if we want the next generation to survive and connect with their culture and heritage they have to feel safe yeah. and most young people don't want to connect with those spaces that's the reason parents have to force them because they've had one sort of a bad experience or another yeah. and that's never been taken into account um solutions wise what i want to present is transformative justice mm -hmm. that means not just writing people off like we've we've got this idea of cancel culture as well either yeah. we inflate somebody up and put them up on a pedestal and they become godlike or, or we on the carpet we tear them down and throw yeah. them in the pit of hell yeah. it's literally one or the other yeah. you can't survive in the middle and yeah. i'm saying hang on a second if we're all human can't we isn't there a way to repair our mistakes yeah. so i'm not it is humanizing people who have harmed sexual predators people who have hurt other people it's saying that they are still human and if we do the work as a community and mm -hmm. hold them accountable but provide them the resources and the help that there is hope there is a chance if they're willing to do the work for them to find a way back home and reintegrate as safe citizens in our yeah. community and it, it, surely it's a form of mental illness it's <sighs> You've got to be wired up wrong to, to uh, be do, able to do that. Do you know what it is? What, you, what you'll find is most people who partake in that sort of a behavior have been harmed themselves. Right. And that is very common. Yeah. Um, well, it's been normalized to them to some next, to an extent. It's, it's almost like we subliminally learn behavior. Yeah. So children who have grown up in environments of abuse, whether that's alcohol abuse or domestic abuse, are more likely to fall into that behavior when they become adults and when they are in relationships. They are more at risk of that because that's the model that you've grown up with that's subliminally like wired into your brain. Even yeah. though you know it's not right, you're more likely to reach for that because it's easier mm. and you've seen it and yeah. you're like, oh, I've, you know, you lost your rag, you got angry and that's it. Even if it's verbal abuse, yeah. it's still it's still abuse. Yeah. Um, I, I I struggled with this a lot. Like I said to you, I've 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 experienced sexual assault and sexual abuse to humanize the people that cause that sort of a harm to yeah. to children or to yeah, young people that's, that's a big journey. it was really difficult for me yeah I bet. because at the beginning i wanted to write them off and um, for me if you'd have asked me like five years ago or even mm. three or four years ago i just said castrate them yeah that's I bet. it that's that I'm... was my solution yeah. that I've, i know how to fix this problem there's one way yeah. problem solved because yeah. once you start doing that people this is why i, I definitely think twice yeah so <laughs> I, when I went to the UAE, I went to Dubai as my first holiday, um, and this was as an adult in my 30s. Yeah. I went there alone because I felt safe. Right. And I know that it's controversial for a lot of people and every place is problematic. I'm not like celebrating yeah. the, 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 the place, but I'm saying in terms of how they enforce law, there are things that work. There's a reason the crime rate is so low. Yeah. And if if those sorts of laws were widely used across yeah. the world and women felt safer, I think that we'd see a lot of different types of crimes I, reduced. I think the problem is, is that with those sorts of brutal laws, is that if someone's not done it... <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, sorry, here's your hand in a yeah, bag <laughs> in some ice. <laughs> there is also like... <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna need a sewing kit with that, mate. <laughs> I think the problem is, is especially in like in 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 Western culture, there's a lot of false accusations that can go around. Yeah. And you gotta be you gotta be damn sure. Yeah, you, you gotta be damn sure. Like castrate that man. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, here's a bag. Yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna be able to sew that back <laughs> I'd have to be joining that group of people we were talking about before. There you go, new communities, <laughs> part of evolution. In the, in <laughs> but, but so, okay, that, that's where I thought that, you know, this is, this is a solution. This is how we can eliminate the problem because yeah. I like to think that I'm a solution-oriented person. 
<laughs> but that has evolved <laughs> in in these <laughs> more later years yeah. where I realized that there are other ways and um if they fail we've always got that as an option mm. um but how do we treat them like humans and not take away their humanity mm-hmm. um and this is this is a way that could work but it requires us all to pitch in as a community yeah. and say okay we're going to hold this person person accountable and in our uh, community spaces or in our homes or in our faith institutions these measures are going to be put into place this is how the the organizers or the committee members will will play a role this is how the community will play a role in holding that accountability and in providing that support as well because providing therapy to victims isn't enough yes it's needed absolutely it's desperately needed that's not the solution though we're still remedying all of the symptoms that have been caused as a result of it yeah. if we're not working to provide education for young men and for young women on how to have healthy conversations how to deal with their emotions and how to have healthy relationships yeah. if we're not talking to them about their sexuality and how <laughs> how they're evolving into young adults yeah if we don't connect that with their values and their practices and we're saying no that's a white mentality and you're not allowed to have that education in your yeah. school uh, my dad didn't sign on for me to go to sex ed class yeah um but my teacher let me sneak in my dad yeah. didn't know that yeah. but my dad was like no you're not gonna go yeah. this is dirty yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally his response i was like yeah. okay wow. i didn't know what was going on i was 11. yeah um But if we normalize these conversations and provide that education for young people, then we've got a chance at finding a solution and actually being able to I want to say eliminate sexual violence in our community. Yeah. There's there there are unfortunately some people that we won't be able to help and that's the truth. Um but we can always dream of trying to do something good and for me that dream is that to eliminate sexual abuse in in the south asian community and just what brought the survey about yes it is um i tried to look at statistics of uh reported abuse yeah in the south asian community and we have blanket figures but it's it's one of the types of crimes that goes most underreported for the south asian community right so the government doesn't have statistics therefore they think this doesn't happen therefore the patriarchy within the south asian community thinks this is not a problem because there are no statistics to support it right however if you speak to south asian women of any community they will tell you an endless string of stories that they have been through and i promise you there's not a single woman in your life that hasn't experienced some form of sexual harassment or sexual violence they've just never had the chance to talk about it and mm-hmm. who they don't talk to is men they talk to each other mm-hmm. that's why the men don't know and all of our structures the homes the businesses the faith spaces the community spaces are all led and run by men yeah so how can they know when they haven't had the conversation they don't see it to be important and there's no need for it we have to change that and i i discovered that when i tried to approach the gurdwaras and the community saying that we need to talk about this and there are cases that have come up publicly in the us and in the uk as well and the the responses that i received were no nope, these are isolated incidents you're making a big deal out of nothing and i got a lot of shit for this i got accused of making gurdwaras and the sick community look bad at a time where they're fighting as a community to present a positive image in the yeah. media so that we're not criminalized criminalized or labeled as terrorists and there's me part of the same community now like rubbing shit all over their name essentially um i got threats i got very violent surely threats. what you're doing is trying to improve that community surely that's a positive thing for the community but how it was received was that and mm. uh, you understand this because you're you're born and you're of a, you're of this generation mm-hmm. right but the older generation who run the gurdwaras who run those community spaces they they, they didn't see that they didn't think there was a need they thought that i'm just slandering them and i'm making a fuss about something that doesn't exist and it's happened in one or two places it's like trump saying mm. there's one or two bad apples <laughs> it's not the case yeah. um there there's a problem in the system The biggest problem is the culture of silence. Yeah. 
that extends across the whole of the South Asian community. The thing that we are best at is wearing the mask and lying. Mm. The South Asian community have mastered lying before they've learnt their ABC. Mm. Why? Because when something happens in your home, the first thing that's drummed into you is you don't tell anybody else outside of these four walls what goes on in here. Mm. That's how you you show your loyalty to yeah. your pack. Yeah. And that is what you are trained with from a young age, yeah. which means that whatever goes on behind those doors, it doesn't matter how horrific it is, you do not speak of it. Mm. And the, the fear for me as a child um, was that which of the two evils is greater to live in this environment which is dangerous or to be separated from my family and be put into foster care and then thrown into the social care system and you know mm. never probably see them again yeah. which is the the greater of two evils and for me it was to stay with my pack at least I knew them yeah at least they were mine yeah instead of being thrown off somewhere else and being treated like god knows what yeah so that's that's magnified across our community because when we talk about abuse when we talk about sexual violence just saying the word sex people like oh no yeah they have an aversion to it yeah. right um so when we're trying to talk about things that are problematic they're like no 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 talk about the good things talk about the Sikhs who are out there feeding the homeless or who are doing all of this other great work mm -hmm. highlight all of the good things don't talk about this because that means that we've got work to do and we're we're not good enough but we're trying to show to the community that we are you know shining exemplary citizens of society yeah and i was like this doesn't take away from that for me it doesn't for me, for me it adds exactly but their mentality is of deflecting yeah. um and i i was told that if this is such a widespread problem bring us the victims we want to hear their stories we want to know what happened to them and as if that's going to happen well i i sat there and i said to them so you you want to be you want to sit here and be judge jury and executioner for victims who have been traumatized in mm. these spaces by men you're going to sit here and speak to them most probably very insensitively and aggressively yeah. quizzing them about what happened to them that that led to that abuse what were they wearing what did they say yeah. who was he did they lead him on yeah. you know what did they do to invite that situation yeah. right um and then after that you're probably going to tell them that they should have reported it and if they didn't it's their own fault. Yeah. And I said I'm I, because I've got a background of therapy, I understand what re-traumatization is. Mm. And I said I am not about to parade a line of victims here for you to abuse further. Yeah. That doesn't sit well with me. No. From their mindset, I can understand they needed evidence. They needed to believe that what I was saying was real. Mm. And the only way they could fathom that was to hear it from the mouths of these victims. What they don't understand is the layers of trauma that these victims have carried and that they're suffering. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I had to find another solution. Right. And I was looking for data and I saw that there is no data. We have to do our work ourselves, basically. Right. And um, the reason that this first survey is directed to the Punjabi and Sikh community, because every different cultural group has its own nuances and needs. So how do people take part in this survey? So we've got it available online on yeah. the Core Voices website, okay. which is corevoices.org. It's yeah. in Punjabi and it's available in English. Yeah. And we'll what, put it in the description on, on this as well. Awesome. What we want to do is be able to take this data and look through that data and understand where the gaps are, where are the, the most vulnerable areas where people are at risk and how can we provide solutions. And okay. once we've... And is that anonymous for them? So th It is anonymous. And this survey, as I said, is directed to the Punjabi and Sikh community. But once we've implemented a system and structure to be able to bring in this reform and this support, we want to be able to replicate this for all other South Asian communities. We want to take it to every single faith group and ensure that our young people in our communities, in their homes, and especially in their religious settings are safe. Um, so we will then provide this survey to each different cultural group right. so that we can understand what the needs are. It's not a blanket, one one size fits all. Yeah, yeah, of course. And that's, that's where we've gone wrong in the past. That's where safeguarding from a Western lens isn't adequate enough for the South Asian community. And 
that's what I've been learning about and we're trying to provide and create the solutions for that with courses and trainings and working with government bodies to be able to make sure we can do this on a larger scale. Yeah. And where's, where is the, the centre of this work taking place? Is it in London at the minute or Birmingham or is it just anywhere in the UK? So we are international, we're based yeah. online. Yeah. Um, I've, we've got a team of volunteers in the US yeah. and in the UK okay, as well. Wow. So, so in the US as well? Yes. That's brilliant. Um, and we, we want to be able to cater to the global South Asian community because okay. we need this work everywhere. Yeah. And there's a, there's a large South Asian community all over the world now. Like yeah. US, Canada, mm -hmm. Australia. Everywhere. Yeah. Like everywhere. All over the Commonwealth. Yeah. Even Europe. Yeah. There's, there's massive amounts of us everywhere. And in Spain surprisingly italy as well really mm -hmm. wow. massive yeah get about that <laughs> there you go <laughs> they get everywhere <laughs> but uh, it's this is the thing like if if in the larger populations where we sit together yeah if we can get our voices heard and our needs catered to then we can support you know our siblings in other countries as well by by giving them those systems and yeah. saying okay speak to your you know your your government officials and ask them to implement this or to work with you know with the UK bodies or the US bodies to actually bring in these layers of accountability because it's it exists everywhere we've heard about the abuse that goes on within the church systems as well yeah. it it's everywhere it really is but we're undermining how widespread a problem child sexual abuse actually is would you expand beyond just the south asian community yeah to into... absolutely yeah. absolutely we need to um because children everywhere are at risk and during covid i don't know how much you know about what goes on online there's more community groups i want to say they've been called vigilantes but i call them community groups they're people yeah. who are actually looking after the community who are going out there to catch predators because yeah, yeah. people have like been at hunters. home yeah yeah i've seen them but can you imagine where you've got you've got unfortunately it's mostly men yeah. who do this yeah and they're going to meet underage girls essentially yeah That's i've, who I've seen been it i've seen to. it on fit i've watched some of the hunters videos on facebook and it's, it's wild. For me, there's so many things about how they communicate with young people that I don't get, but they get into the forums and um, apparently it's through the dark web. I don't know how that works. I'm not a tech person, yeah. but it's just the research that I've been doing where there are police bodies who monitor that behavior, yeah. uh, monitor those patterns and those conversations yeah. and stuff. Even pretend to be them as well, don't they? And through these gaming, like where you do live gaming things yeah, yeah. and you make connections with people yeah. and then they, they chat really, to young pe young kids. These paedophiles are really freaking motivated, aren't they? They really are. And that's really scary. It's disgusting, isn't it? It's really, really scary. Um, honestly, this it's, it's really hard to do this work because some yeah. of the things I've read about and listened to, it, oh. it makes me want to vomit and yeah. it makes my insides hurt. You Where? know what, it's scary because I've got, I've got a little girl, she's two now, mm. and it horrifies, it, the thought of anything ever happening to her, like, it, it makes me feel sick to my core. Um, so it is important work. This is why we need to do it. We yeah. need to make sure that the next generation that follows us doesn't have to suffer that same pain that we yeah. did. You know, that's the responsibility that we have, which is why we've got to come together as a community and make it a movement and say, we won't tolerate child sexual abuse. It's it's n not acceptable in any form or capacity. We have to be able to call it out. What I think there was one documentary I was watching more people have been watching, um, I'm going to call them, they call it child porn. It's not child porn because it's not consensual. Mm. It's child abuse videos mm. that men are watching and getting off on them. And because they are bored, there's nothing to do during COVID and maybe they've watched everything else that exists on Pornhub. I don't know why they do it, but they've engaged, th this is what has gone you've up be, in terms of content be, that's gotta been be consumed. Wrong. There's gotta be something wrong with them. To watch that, like, you've gotta be mentally, gotta be wired up wrong. I don't know anyone, you'd I don't be know surprised. any male that in my friend group or acquaintance Would group, they tell you though, if they did? Would they sit and say, hey, do you know what? I got off on some child porn last night. Would they mm. actually have the guts to say no, that? No, they wouldn't. Because no. you'd probably punch them in the face yeah. if they did, right? Yeah. I would. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some things that people do behind closed doors because they know it's not socially acceptable. Mm. But just because we don't know about it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, no. The fact that, but the, I think I think to do that for me, it's so it's so wrong and alien to what anything I could Im like. It's just so wrong on every level. I can't imagine how a human being or a man could do that. Mm -hmm without there being white, there's something wrong with him. I just can't, emp I can't, I can't understand it on any way, on any level. So I, I'm assuming there must be some form of mental illness or there's something wrong with someone who can find that, like, like they have a desire to watch that. There's just, definitely something that's broken in the mental health that there has is. To be. And that's why we need to be able to offer repair. Yeah. If we just, you know, exile them or we, you know, we do that cancel culture and throw them to the pits of hell. It doesn't provide a solution. I've got to say, it's pretty tempting to want to do that. I mean, it is, just but thinking about it now, it, it's putting to... fire in my chest. It makes right. me angry to think about it. It's just but disgusting. Say, say if you caught somebody and they got convicted, they went to prison, right? Mm -hmm. And then once they've served their sentence, what happens? They come back out and they do the same thing. What changed? Nothing. Oh, I don't know. I'd probably agree with you on your old, on, on the Dubai laws. <laughs> like, <I don't, laughs> honestly, it, it, it is... It is, it is so wrong on every possible level. You know, most abuse takes place within the homes. Mm. That's where most abuse takes place. And like I said to you, <clears throat> some of the stuff that I've, I've had to educate myself about this. Yeah. I've had to inform myself. It has been so difficult. Like yeah. on, on a human level, it's been heartbreaking yeah. to know that kids who are not even one year old oh. have been have been harmed by people in their own home environment. <laughs> it's, 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 it's unfathomable. But it, it's real. I know, I know, I know. But it's, un it's, it's hard to just comprehend that someone's capable of doing that. Hurting children in any form isn't acceptable. No. And this is what I'm saying. As men that this and is women, what we, we're designed to, well, we're supposed to protect kids. We're supposed to. We're supposed to, but we're not. Mm. And it's just, you know, that out of sight, out of mind thing. Yeah. We can't claim that ignorance anymore because the longer we stay silent, we're complicit. Yeah. And Absolutely, I know that that yeah. might be harsh for some people, but I don't care. That's the truth. If we're not doing something positively to change it, then we we are encouraging paedophiles and sexual predators to do what they do. Exactly. So we have to do more to stand against it and be more vigilant about how kids are using the internet, who they're talking to, who their friends are. Do you know them? Are you aware of wherever they're, you know, they're going and who they're meeting? You have to be informed. You have to connect with your children. And this is a problem because most parents don't communicate with their kids effectively. Mm -hmm. So the kids don't tell them or they'll lie to them. Mm -hmm. And most young people, they're not even teenagers yet. They don't tell their parents um, if they're talking to an adult, if they've met a cool older guy who's yeah. buying them nice things or taking them nice places mm -hmm. and you know buying them McDonald's every day. That's all it takes to yeah. get a kid to befriend you, yeah. right? They're not going to tell their parents because if they do, they're going to, all of a sudden this cool supply of free stuff is going to get cut off, <laughs> yeah. right? If the parents aren't communicating and they don't have that relationship, that's part of the problem. Mm. If we don't know how to have good conversations, um, even when, within our peer groups, that's yeah. part of the problem as well. Because if boys your own age are talking shit to you, yeah. then you're looking for something different and yeah. you want someone to care for you yeah. and you get that affection you're happily you'll be groomed by an older man without knowing that you're being groomed yes it's the man's fault it's not the child's fault at any point it's not the child's fault well, that's why it's important that work like this is getting done isn't it yeah it is was it for this work that you got your mbe i got my mbe i actually forgot about that for a second there so i got my mbe last year yeah um in march for, the, for, for this work um, it was for my work in the sick community yeah. with the music that I do for mental wellness. Right. Um, but the moment I got my MB, literally two days later, we went on national lockdown. Oh, wow. So you didn't even get to celebrate it. haven't had a party yet. Wow. We need to have an MBE party. How did you get an MBE? <laughs> How did I get the MBE? Uh, yeah, what do they do? Um, do they like, ring you go, hi, do you want an MBE? Like, <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah. Um, do you apply for it? Is it like, so I... I there is a nomination process yeah. and it's it's a pretty like rigorous, not a easy process as far as I'm aware. 
somebody an, uh, anonymous, I don't know who, did the work of nominating me. Wow. And thought that I was deserving of this accolade and recognition. And um, when I got the letter in the yeah. post, get this, I uh, so my <laughs> brother, he's an artist yeah. and um, he he's amazing with watercolors. He's a, he does like all sorts of stuff creatively. Yeah. Photography and <clears throat> graphic design is yeah. what he's great at. I was away on a tour yeah. in the US and um, he's like, he, he's my assistant, he's awesome. Yeah. He sent me photographs of my, my mail that came through and he yeah. sent me this letter and I thought he was messing with me. Yeah, like he'd photoshopped it. Yep, yep. So he sends me this letter and I called him back and I was like, you know, are you trying to take me for a ride here? I'm not yeah. that stupid. Yeah. So like, what are you talking about? And I was like, the letters that you sent to me, he's like, I didn't even read them. And I said, are you joking? And I thought, because he's really good. We're great at playing right. pranks on each other. Like, we're really good. <laughs> um, and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, get home and have a look at the yeah. letter and call me back. So he gets back from work and he yeah. calls me. And he's screaming down the phone at me. He's like, this is amazing. This is fucking awesome. And oh. I was like, so you didn't Photoshop this and send it to wow. me. <laughs> that was my first reaction. I thought he was punking me. Um, and then when I realized it was real, I was yeah. like, oh, my God. So did Do you meet the Queen? I didn't meet the Queen, but I met Prince Charles and I shook his hand and we had a five minute, at least a five minute conversation. Oh really? What was he like? He was quite nice. He asked me if I play the sitar and I was like, no, that's not one of the instruments that I play. Uh, I play the instruments pre-colonization. Okay. And he <laughs> smiled at me. Yeah. <laughs> I did it. You so you knew where yeah. you were coming from straight yes. away. And then I told him, I said, I, I work with music and mental health and we need to do that work with the Prince's Trust. And he was like, yes, we should. <laughs> but he was, he was lovely for was those it? couple of minutes. Yeah. And everybody asked me what he talked to me about because with everyone else, apparently it was just a quick handshake and yeah. they just moved along, but we chatted. Right. Um, but the most fun part of it was I got to take my mom yeah. to Buckingham Palace. Wow. And the background that we come from, yeah. you know, that wasn't something yeah. I ever thought would have been possible. That's incredible. And it was, it was awesome. Um, I made a point of wearing traditional Punjabi dress. Yeah. Like everybody else was like going out buying designer, yeah. you know, Western dresses. I was yeah. like, sod that. Yeah. I, when I'd gone to India, yeah. uh, I was there in February. Yeah. I had something made that was just very typical Punjabi. Yeah. And I wore that and everybody was like, oh my God, your outfit's awesome. I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the best part of it for my mom yeah. that she was telling every, everyone yeah. about wasn't that her daughter got an MBE. Yeah. <laughs> she said, I met Ainsley Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> Like, are you kidding me <laughs> wow. so he was receiving an mbe on the same day and um him and my mom were having a great conversation really and it actually got caught on one of the video cameras because we bought the video afterwards yeah, they, yeah you know you're allowed to do that yeah. you can't have your own cameras but that got caught on on video where he's hugging her and they're having a chat oh, and wow. she's telling him how to improve some of his indian dishes and she's like come over to the house and i'll feed you indian food oh amazing <laughs> so that was her her highlight was like, you met cool. Michelle Obama as well haven't you I did yes I did you've done your research it was the PR team they're pretty good at this you've got a great team <laughs> you got a great team I did I met Michelle Obama a couple of years ago what's she like delightful like, is she oh, as she comes she's across? majestic she's even better than she comes across honestly I'm, I'm not wowed by many people yeah I was just like starstruck really yeah She's got personality and grace and she's real. Yeah. Um, before um, I got a chance to speak to her, she was speaking to an older lady who was in a wheelchair and she's got all of her security team around her who are trying to say, you know, you've got to move to the next person now. Um, and she was like, no, I'm talking to, I'm, I can't remember what she called her, but she said, I'm talking to an elder. And she was like, you know, everyone else can wait. Yeah. And she took her time to speak to this elder black lady who's sitting in a wheelchair and just telling her how great work she's doing and how proud of her she is. Um, it was it was really, really lovely to witness that wow. because it wasn't for the cameras. It wasn't for publicity. That was just who she was. Was and that was in like, England? That was in the US. I'm trying to think where was it? I think it was in Denver, Colorado, right. where I met her. And for me, I took a lot of inspiration from that meeting for, with her. Did you chat to her? I did chat to her. What did she say? What oh did you talk about? God, I was telling her how amazing she is and yeah. how much it mattered to me as a young woman of color 
to see another woman of color in in a position of power using it for the right reasons yeah not just sitting there to be a showpiece but actually doing work on the ground and how much inspiration i'd taken from the work that she'd done and what she was giving back to the community she'd be a good president ma'am she would be amazing she, she would be president. amazing i want to be her best friend yeah i, I love her i think <laughs> But that's what I think that we need more Please people. Tell like, her that. We need we need more people like Michelle Obama, don't we? Yeah, we do. I really wish she would have uh, gone for president. Who knows? There's still hope. There's right? still, she's not she's not that old, is she? She's plenty no. of time. Yeah. There's still hope. Yeah. That that would change the game. I mean, now having uh, Kamala Harris yeah. as the VP in the yeah. US for South Asian women, yeah, it's, it's just like, oh my God, yeah. the sky's the limit, yeah. right? And I mean, even Meghan Markle, yeah. to be able to get into the royal family, I know that's been difficult and it's problematic and yeah. there's so many things to it, but it almost makes it it's possible. It's symbolic, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the fairy tale could be possible yeah. to some degree. And it allows us to dream again mm -hmm. because our parents took away, like that generation took away the idea of dreaming big. Mm -hmm. You've got to dream within your means. You can, yeah. you can become an accountant. You can become a lawyer. Yeah. You can achieve success to a degree. Mm -hmm. But to dream without limits was taken away from us. You know, yeah. we had to dream within measure. And seeing these examples takes that away. It takes away the restrictions where it means we could do anything we wanted to do, really. Yeah. Right? So we're allowed to dream again. Yeah, man. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jasper. This has been brilliant. Thank you. This Thank was you. so joyful.